Open the door, police! Open the door, police! Radio went from an obscure interest to a household comfort all within the decade to the early 1920s. But it was still tightly regulated by government. The authorities barely tolerated amateur experimenters who could intercept official communication. Rules and fees were imposed, with those for listeners later funding broadcasting. All along, there were those who wouldn't get a licence. Possibly in a nod to the Navy's early use of radio, illegal users were called pirates, whether receiving or transmitting. Today, you'll hear about some of Australia's transmitting pirates. Using Trove newspaper archives, I'll cover from the early 1920s, when broadcasting started, to the late 1940s, when war surplus gear made piracy easier and cheaper than ever. Not all who transmitted did so purposely, though. An oscillating regenerative receiver was also a transmitter. It could cause interference over a wide area, given the outdoor antennas commonly used. The authorities didn't much like regenerative sets. They preferred TRF receivers. However, these were less sensitive and selective. With an ability to receive Morse, the regen was popular with amateurs who couldn't afford a more complex superhead. The article states that oscillating regions were illegal unless the user passed a 12 words per minute Morse test, presumably as part of an amateur licence. Now on to the fun stuff. The late 1920s were busy years for pirates. Father and son wireless dealer Francis and Earl Dunn in Melbourne got done for doing transmitting tests in 1925. Their fines were around £5, worth over $400 today. The following year, Robert Bruce of Caulfield established a wireless transmitting set and used it for four months between April and August 1926. He was described as a wireless engineer. Bruce was running 100 watts at a time when amateurs could only run 10 watts. He was fined £5 on each charge, plus costs. And his transmitter was confiscated. Pirates were also active in Adelaide. There are many with great expense incurred to find them. Donald G. Taylor, aged 18, was one of them. Taylor was no QRPer. Apparently, he had unlimited power to interfere with broadcasters. And he communicated to America with the pirate call sign 5DX. Taylor couldn't pass the amateur exam and knew that what he was doing was illegal. His gear was set up in readiness for when he could pass the exam. Taylor had a history of piracy, having been fined £14 in Victoria. This time he was fined £10 with 17 shillings costs. Another teenager, 19-year-old Reginald Percival White of Hawthorne, also copped a £10 fine. The Melbourne Argus, 5th of April 1928, reported that William Henry Conway, radio inspector, found a complete station in White's sleepout. White had used the fake call signs 3PR and 3AA. Defending the charges, White said the equipment was not a transmitter. Instead, it was an attachment to his receiver to allow Morse code practice. The call signs were used on a landline connected to the house. He said that any receiver on the market could be used as a transmitter. 
his equipment was automatically confiscated. Young Reginald was not deterred for long. By the following year, he had rebuilt his station bigger and better. This time, transmitting music using the call sign CQ. Detective Webster had peeped through a hole in the door of White's sleepout. He saw White operating what appeared to be a keyboard. White pushed some paper into the peephole and didn't open up. The inspector then forced himself in as White pulled his wireless apparatus to the floor. Found was a phonograph with a record of the songs that the inspector had just heard. Fish gotta swim, bird gotta fly. I gotta love one man till I die. I'll tell loving that man of mine. The wireless inspector told the court that he had picked up music being broadcast from White's house. Transmitting equipment was found when the house was searched. White said he was merely experimenting and not doing anything illegal. The magistrate said he had not learned his lesson, so doubled the fine compared to last time. He said that enthusiasm is all right, but you must conform to the law. He was fined £20 with the set confiscated. If news reports are anything to go by, pirate transmitting took a dive during the Great Depression, but was back by the late 30s. By this time, the PMG had direction finding cars. Jack Horn of Sherwood in Brisbane was causing interference to local receivers. He had sat for his amateur certificate, but failed. Horn's equipment was found in a room under his house. The PMG had found it difficult to get prosecutions. Horn, though, was an easy target as he used an unallocated call sign and had shoddy equipment that interfered with broadcast reception. He was fined £8. People with illegal receivers were fined less, typically between two and six pounds. Another pirate who failed the ham test was over the border in Cessnock, New South Wales. Edward Davies of Kearsley was fined 50 pounds for using VK2YQ. He used the station to communicate with his daughter and son-in-law who are at present in England. Given the size of the fine, Using the station as a family telephone was presumably thought more heinous than just experimenting. Potentially even more serious were goings on in Western Australia under the pirated call sign 6BK. It was claimed that the pirate had interfered with messages to and from the airliner Bungana. The PMG spent weeks of searching. William Bradburn of Osborne Park was prosecuted but denied the charge. The PMG said that their DF equipment could pinpoint the transmissions to within 20 yards of Bradburn's house. Bradburn had the parts to build a transmitter, said that a crystal broke. There is discussion in the court about how crystals could break if too much power was applied. The evidence was circumstantial and the judge initially reserved his decision. The following month, Bradburn was fined £5 with £3 costs. Licensed radio amateurs had to close their stations, have their gear impounded and stay off the air for the duration of World War II. But that didn't stop the pirates. George S. Miles of Ride in Sydney was fined £20 for transmitting recorded music and messages to friends in 1940. The SM said that he got off lightly 
with a potential £500 fine and five years in jail. However, there is no question of espionage. Miles had also served in the Navy. It cost £150 to trace Miles' transmitter. Unauthorised transmitters were seen to harm national security. Before World War II, there are 2,089 licensed transmitters in Australia. All had been told to dismantle their stations. On the other side of Sydney Harbour, John Alfred Skinner of Coogee was seven pounds lighter after transmitting gramophone records over his homemade set in 1943. Skinner, a sheet metal worker, had spent five pounds building his transmitter from scraps. He used the call sign 2AK and had announced the titles of songs. He thought it would only transmit 200 yards, but the Crown said that the gear was as powerful as licensed station 2KY. The SM said that pirate radio transmitting was a dangerous activity of value to the enemy. The end of World War II was a great time to be a radio pirate, if media reports are anything to go by. War disposal shops frequently had cheap parts and transmitters you could buy without producing a license. And this indeed is where many pirates got their start. The PMG department warned that private radio sets, probably walkie-talkies, were being used illegally in Melbourne. They were a potential source of interference to legitimate users. It was claimed that the frequency bands used were too scarce for use by inessential users. They also didn't like walkie-talkies taking revenue from telephone services, which PMG ran. In reply, the Army said that the only walkie-talkies offered to the public through the Disposals Commission could not be repaired. Amateurs and pirates, though, knew otherwise. Licensed amateurs objected to the pirates and complained to the PMG. VK4FN switched on only to hear someone using his own call sign. However, pirates were described as slippery and rarely caught. Hams weren't the only people being messed around with pirates. So were broadcast stations. Melbourne's Age, for 5th of May 1948, reports that an anti-communist pirate was interfering with legitimate broadcaster 3XY. The article surmises the transmitter was probably a small battery-powered type similar to those sold by disposal stores, irrespective of whether the purchaser had a licence. The Wireless Institute of Australia urged amateurs to report reception of pirates to the authorities. A radio madman who misdirected planes made headlines in early June 1949. The pirate was making fake calls to commercial aircraft near Wellington, New Zealand. Popular theory was that the pirate was using war surplus equipment available for £20. Also, aircraft had reverted to instrument control and a new communications procedure developed to try and avoid the interference. Police, civil aviation and Air Force officials deployed DF gear to track down the culprit. By June 10, it was all over with an 18-year-old youth court. That's it for 1920s to 40s pirate tales. If you've got any juicy pirate radio stories, then please share them in the comments below. When I go QRP Portable, I leave a lot of stuff at home. But there's one thing I always take, and that's my Haverford Squid Pole. Available in lengths from 3 to 10 metres, they're ideal for portable, amateur radio, shortwave listening and CB. 
For more information, visit haverford.com.au. That's haverford.com.au. And in an exclusive offer for VK3YE viewers, put in VK3YE as the discount code for polls delivered within Australia. haverford.com.au. Browse their range today and see if any appeal.